Hello and welcome to today's video. I hope you all are healthy. In today's video, I am going to do a deep dive on Amazon Elastic Block Storage or EBS. If you are planning to take any AWS certifications or working as a solution architect, then EBS is a very vital AWS service and one of the few services where pricing is not based on what you use. Today we will discuss everything you need to know about EBS volumes. If you follow today's session without skipping any content, you should be able to answer any EBS related questions in any AWS certification exam and optimally use EBS service in your day to day workload. Before I start, I would like to request you if you are new to our channel or haven't subscribed yet, then please subscribe to our channel and please click on the bell icon. We formed Cloud Expert Solution to help everyone with premium content without any paid subscription. And your support will motivate us. Let's get started with today's agenda first. We'll start with features of Amazon EBS, followed by Amazon EBS volume types. Then we'll review use cases for every volume types, followed by Amazon EBS encryption, then snapshot, then EBS optimized instances. After that, we will review Amazon EBS quotas and at the end, we'll review pricing details. Now let's start with what is Amazon EBS. Amazon EBS or Elastic Block Store is a block level storage volume that you can attach with an EC2 instance. It could be your boot volume or it could be secondary volume. EBS volumes behave like raw, unformatted block devices. EBS is a network volume and you can mount these volumes with your EC2 instances. You can create a file system on top of these volumes. Or you can use any way you use as a block device, such as a hard drive. Now, let's review what are the primary uses for EBS volume. Primary storage for a file system or a database. You may have an application that requires fine granular updates and access to raw, unformatted block level storage. You may have a requirement of a network drive for a virtual machine. EBS also is well suited for database type application that means that requires random read and write and also for throughput intensive applications that perform long, continuous read and writes. Now let's review some key facts that you should remember. EBS is tagged with an availability zone. That means you can create an EBS volume in a specific availability zone and attached with an EC2 instance on the same availability zone. You cannot attach an EBS volume to a cross availability zone EC2 instance. If you remember at the beginning, I told EBS is one of the few services where payment is not based on what you use. Rather, payment is based on your provision volume, not what you use. If I see an example, let's see, let's see you have provision. 100 GB EBS volume with 5000 IOPS. But in a month, you have only used 20 GB. That means you have stored data only 20 GB in that 100 GB EBS volume and you have used only 3500 IOPS. Although you haven't used EBS with the full capacity, AWS will charge you for 100 GB month and 5000 IOPS. As I mentioned in the previous slide, that you can only attach an EBS volume with the EC2 instance from the same availability zone. 
Now, if you have an use case where you have to access the data from a different availability zone, then how can you share the EBS volume data outside the availability zone? In that case, first we'll take a snapshot of that EBS volume, then we'll restore the snapshot to the other availability zone. That means you are taking the snapshot of the EBS volume from availability zone 1 and you are restoring that EBS volume to the availability zone 2. Here you go. Now, once you have restored that EBS volume, then you can attach that EBS volume with the EC2 instance on the other availability zone. As of today, this is the only method that allow cross availability zone data share of a EBS volume. Now let's review different EBS volume types and use cases. There are two different types of EBS volumes. First, SSD volumes and HDD volumes. Now, if we concentrate on the SSD volume, SSD volume has two different types. One is general purpose SSD and second, provision IOPS SSD. This is also called PIOPS. Now, general purpose SSD again segregated into two, GP2 and GP3, whereas provision IOPS has IO1, IO2, and IO2 Block Express. IO2 Block Express is the latest EBS volume that AWS introduced very recently. On the other hand, HDD volumes has two category, throughput optimized and cold HDD. Throughput optimized is called ST1 and cold HDD is called SC1. If you are taking or appearing for AWS certification, you should remember this code name that is GP2, GP3, IO1, IO2, ST1, SC1. Most of the time, AWS certification questions will have this code, not the nomenclature. If they will say that ST1, you have to remember they are talking about throughput optimized. Whereas if they will say about SC1, you have to understand they are talking about cold HDD. Now let's review the use cases for every volume type. First, general purpose SSD, that is GP2 or GP3. Both these volumes can be used as boot volume to your EC2. If you have a medium sized single instance database, you can use that GP2. Because if you are taking any SSD family, provision IOPS will be costlier than general purpose. If you are looking for a medium performance system or if you are looking for a development and test environment where you really do not have a requirement for a high IOPS or throughputs, in that case, GP2 is the best volume for you. To summarize, if you have a low latency interactive application, then GP2 is the right volume for you. On the other hand, for provision IOPS SSD, if you need sub millisecond latency, or if you have a IO intensive workload that is very sensitive to storage performance and consistency, if you may need more than 16,000 IOPS, or 10,000 Mbps throughput, in that case, provision IOPS is the only option. Now, there is a different option instance store, but that is volatile. If you need a persistent storage and IOPS more than 16,000, then provision IOPS is the only option for you. On the other hand, for the HDD category throughput optimized, if you have a requirement for a large sequential workload, such that if you want to set up a EMR cluster, or if you have a workload for ETL, or maybe a data warehouse, or a log processing application, and you are looking for a low-cost magnetic storage, 
then throughput optimized is the option for you. Last but not least, cold HDD. If you have a requirement for a lowest cost magnetic storage, then cold HDD is the option. Please remember this is the lowest cost magnetic storage. In some of the AWS certification, they will give you all different type of EBS volumes and they will ask you what is the lowest cost magnetic. Please do not confuse with throughput optimized and cold HDD. Cold HDD is the lowest cost magnetic storage. If you have an use case for a large sequential cool data workload that does not require frequent access of data, then you can use cold HDD or SC1. I think this is a printing mistake. It should not be ST1. It should be SC1. Cold HDD is SC1 and throughput optimized is ST1. Now let's compare different EBS volume types. In this comparison, we are going to talk about different categories like durability, volume size, max IOPS, max throughput. Can you attach that EBS volume with multiple EC2 instance and can you add as a boot volume? To start with, for general purpose, for both GP2 and GP3, you will get a durability of 99.8 to 99.9 percentage. In terms of volume size, you can create minimum of 1 GB up to 16 terabyte. Please remember maximum IOPS is 16,000. In some AWS certification questions, they will try to trick you with this IOPS. If you have a question where the requirement is more than 16,000 IOPS, then you cannot select general purpose SSD. You must go for a provision IOPS or a instance store. Instance store is a volatile drive. If you stop the EC2 instance, data will be lost. But if you have a requirement for a persistent storage and the IOPS requirement is more than 16,000, in that case, provision IOPS is the option. In terms of throughput, if you are selecting GP3, then maximum throughput is 1000 MB per second. Whereas for GP2, maximum IOPS will be 250 MB per second. You cannot attach general purpose SSD with multiple EC2 instance. That is why EBS multi-attachment is not supported for general purpose. But you can use that one as a boot volume. So general purpose SSD supports put volume. Now let's review provision IOPS SSD. As I mentioned, it has three types, IO2 Block Express, IO2 and IO1. For IO2 Block Express and IO2, the durability is 99.999%. Whereas for IO1, this is similar to GP2, that means 99.8 to 99.9 percent. In terms of volume size, please remember IO2 block express you can create till 64 terabyte. Minimum is 4 terabyte. But for IO2 and IO1, minimum is 4 terabyte and maximum is 16 terabyte. In terms of IOPS, IO2 block express can go till 256,000 IOPS, whereas IO2 and IO1 has maximum of 64,000 IOPS. In terms of throughput, IO2 Block Express can go up to 4,000 MB per second. IO2, IO1 has maximum of 1,000. Any provision IOPS can be used for EBS multi-attachment. That means you can attach this EBS volume with multiple EC2 instances. And provision IOPS also support boot volume. Next, HDD volumes. As I mentioned, we have ST1 and SC1, that is throughput optimized and cold HDD. In terms of durability, 
it is 98.8 to 99.9 percentage in terms of volume size it can have a minimum of 125 gb till 16 terabyte for maximum iops st1 can go up to 500 iops whereas sc1 will go up to 250 iops for throughput st1 will give you 500 mb per second sc1 will give you 250 mb per second hdd volumes cannot be used as boot volume and you can't use hdd volume for ebs multi attachment please note that this slide or this comparison is very vital if you remember these figures or these numbers you are halfway done for the ebs in many aws certifications they will try to trick you with these numbers you have to remember this table by heart now next we will review ebs encryption and here are the key points please remember you can only encrypt ebs volume at the time of creation if there is any option in aws certification that talks about enabling encryption to a existing volume that is strictly no as of today ebs does not provide any capability that you can enable or disable encryption in a ebs volume that is why there is no way to enable or disable encryption for a ebs volume please remember this point ebs encryption used 256 bit aes encryption that is advanced encryption standard you can use aws own key aws kms manage keys or customer manage keys for your ebs encryption snapshot of an encrypted ebs volume will be always encrypted you will get some aws questions for this fact also if you have an encrypted ebs volume you cannot create an unencrypted snapshot from that ebs volume encryption cannot be turned off for an encrypted ebs volume this is another one vital fact when you first create an encrypted ebs volume in a region a default master key is automatically created in kms unless and until you will select customer manage key or kms managed key you can encrypt boot volume as well as additional volumes in ec2 instance you can also do a mix and match that means you can keep your boot volume unencrypted and the additional volume encrypted please remember you have to enable encryption at the time of ebs volume creation that means if you have an ec2 instance where the boot volume is not encrypted or unencrypted you can attach a secondary encrypted ebs volume to that ec2 instance and the vice versa you can't share an encrypted ebs snapshot if that encryption is with default kms key you can only share an encrypted snapshot if you have used customer manage key please remember these facts these are very important for any aws certifications and you will get some questions to verify these facts now the next point is how to encrypt an unencrypted ebs volume obviously this is a very vital use case you might get that use case in your day to day work now let's review how can you encrypt an unencrypted ebs volume please remember there is no concept of enable encryption this is very vital point now let's see the process first you have to take a snapshot of that existing volume after that you can copy that snapshot as a encrypted snapshot and then from that encrypted snapshot you can restore as a encrypted ebs volume this is one option so let's say if you have an unencrypted ebs volume take a snapshot copy that snapshot as a encrypted snapshot and then restore that encrypted snapshot as a encrypted ebs volume 
there is one more way and you really do not have to do all these three steps. What you can do, you can take a snapshot and restore that snapshot as an encrypted EBS volume. That means in the method 2, you have an unencrypted snapshot while restoring that snapshot as the EBS volume, you can enable encryption. These are the two ways which will help you to convert an unencrypted EBS volume to an encrypted EBS volume. Now let's review EBS snapshots. You can create automated snapshots and manual snapshot of EBS volume. Automated snapshot means you can create a schedule and in that schedule, regularly it will automatically create an EBS snapshot. On the same time, if you have a requirement to create a snapshot, you can go to the EBS dashboard and you can create a snapshot from there. EBS snapshots are incremental. That means the difference between the two snapshots will have only the delta. Now, EBS snapshots are stored in S3 bucket but you cannot view them in S3 bucket. This is another one very vital point. Snapshots are redundantly stored in multiple availability zone. To achieve high availability, whenever you will create any snapshot, snapshot will be by default stored in S3 bucket and S3 bucket property, that means replicating the data across multiple availability zone will be applicable for the snapshot also. Next, you do not have to detach the volume for taking a snapshot. While the volume is in use, you can take a snapshot. EBS volumes created from an encrypted snapshot will be automatically encrypted. On the other way around, if you have an encrypted EBS snapshot, you won't be able to create any unencrypted EBS volume. This is another one very vital point. Any EBS volumes created from an encrypted snapshot will be automatically encrypted. You can share manual snapshot with specific AWS account or you can make it public. But please remember, automated snapshot cannot be shared. To share a automated snapshot, you have to copy that snapshot. Next. Even though snapshots are incremental, the snapshot deletion process is designed so that you only retain the value or the data that is required for the most snapshot. When you will delete any previous snapshots, AWS will automatically adjust and if you will use the latest snapshot, you will not lose any data out of that snapshot. Now this is very vital point. Let's say you have one EBS volume, you have created a snapshot, now you are restoring the snapshot. Maybe you have 250 GB of data. All the data will not be preloaded. When you create that EBS volume, if you attach with an EC2 instance, if you try to access the data, you might see some latency. Because EBS will not load all the data at a go. If you need to remove that latency. In that case, you should enable Fast Snapshot Restore or FSR. Please remember that term for any certification exam. You can enable Fast Snapshot Restore or FSR. If you have a requirement or if you want to avoid the delay or the initial performance hit for the EBS initialization process. Now let's review. EBS optimized EC2 instances. Now first let's understand what is EBS optimized EC2 instance. An EBS optimized instance that uses an optimized configuration stack and provides additional dedicated capacity for Amazon EBS IO or EBS IO operation. I know this is a definition and it has lot of words like optimized configuration stack, additional dedicated capacity. Now let's try to understand what does it actually mean. Let's say you have created an EBS volume. It could be general purpose SSD, it could be provision. Whatever the IOPS you have provision, 
most of the time you will not get 100% IOPS or 90% IOPS. If you want to utilize the EBS capacity on a full, you have an option to select EBS optimized instances. If you are using EBS optimized instances for general purpose SSD, you will get at least 90% of the provision IOPS performance for 99% of the time in a given year. Whereas for provision IOPS, you will get at least 90% of the provision IOPS for 99.9% .9 of the time in a given year. So you can understand if you want to utilize the EBS IOPS capacity in full, you should go for EBS optimized IOPS instances. Now you must be thinking, what are the EBS optimized instances? There are two different type of instances. One is EBS optimized by default and second is EBS optimization supported. When you are selecting EBS optimization by default, that means that will have EBS optimization when you are launching that instance. You have an option to enable or disable that optimization. For EBS optimization by default, if you enable or if you disable, it does not have any effect. If you disable the EBS optimization in a EBS optimized by default, then also you will get EBS optimization. On the other hand, EBS optimization supported, that means by default EBS optimization will not be enabled. You have to enable or disable that EBS optimization. Now there are some key points. You can enable EBS optimization at launch or if you have an existing instance, you can enable or disable that EBS optimization. Please remember when you enable that EBS optimization, you will pay an additional hourly fee for that capacity. Now you can enable or disable optimization of an existing instance by modifying its EBS optimized instance attribute. That means when you enable or modify that attribute, you will get maximum IO out of that EBS. And one point you have to remember, if you are using an existing EC2 instance and if you are trying to enable, then after changing that configuration or after modifying that attribute, you must stop and start that EC2 instance to enable or disable. Now, one point I would like to call out, if that EC2 instance have an instance store that is a volatile memory, you must copy all the data. If you stop an EC2 instance with the instance store, any data you are storing in that instance store will be lost when you stop. So please remember, if you are using an EC2 instance with instance store, and if you have to enable or disable the optimization when you are stopping, please copy the data from that instance store to a persistent memory if you require the data. Now let's review what are the EBS optimized instance by default or what are the supported instance. So here is the AWS documentation. This documentation is related to EC2. If I come to the storage section, under EBS volume, we have an option called EBS optimization. Now, as I was talking here, that there are two types, EBS optimized by default and EBS optimization supported. Now let's review what are the EBS optimized by default. There are different category, general purpose, compute optimized, memory, storage, and accelerated compute. And here are the families or here are the series A1 medium, A1 large. These are all by default. If you are using any one of the EC2 instance, then EBS optimization will be enabled by default. If we'll scroll down to section two, where EBS optimization supported, that means C1 extra large, C3 extra large. So this is the entire list which is EBS optimization supported. That means if you are using C1 extra large, then EBS optimization will not be enabled by default, but you can enable if you want to.
Now let's close this AWS documentation and go back to our PPT. Our next topic is service quotas. Please remember the service quota for concurrent snapshot copies per destination region that is not adjustable. Whatever the quota you have, you cannot place a request to adjust that volume. Second, IOPS modification and storage modification quotas applicable to the aggregate of current values. Now let's try to understand with an example. Let's say you have a IOPS modification quota for provision IOPS SSD volume and that is 40,000. Now if you have 3 IO1 volume with 15,000 IOPS, for scenario 1, if you are requesting for a concurrent IOP modification for two volumes, in that case your aggregate is 15,000 into 2 that is 30,000. Your quota is 40,000. You are well below the quota and that request is allowed. But if you are requesting for a three concurrent volume, in that case the IO1 IOPS is 15,000. For three it will be 45,000 which is well above the quota and that request will be denied. So please remember these quotas are not adjustable and IOPS modification and storage modification quota that is applicable to the aggregate current values. And with that, let's review other service quotas what we have. If I'll go to AWS documentation, these are the service quotas currently we have. Now archive snapshot for volume. Each supported region has 25 and these are adjustable. Adjustable yes means you can adjust this number. That means you can request for an increase. Concurrent snapshot copies per destination region. The current quota is 20 and you cannot adjust. Concurrent snapshot per cold HDD or SC1 volume only one and you cannot adjust. Concurrent snapshot per general purpose or GP2 volume that is 5 and you cannot. Like that way, this is the entire list. First snapshot restore by default quota is 50. You can adjust, you can request for increase. Similarly, get snapshot block request for account by default 1000 per second. You can increase. Like that way, if you review this document, you will see all those quotas. You really do not have to remember these quotas for any AWS certification exam. They are not going to ask you any question related to these quotas. Now let's close this AWS documentation and go back to our slide. The last topic for today's that is EBS pricing. Now let's review the EBS pricing and as you know AWS changes their pricing very frequently. That is why Let's go back to AWS documentation and review the pricing there. Now these are the different pricing and pricing is based on the region. You have to first select the region. For me, Northern Virginia is the closest region and now these are the price. For GP3 storage, 0.08 GB per month. Now how you are going to calculate the GB per month? Here is an example. Let's say you this is a pricing example for that. Let's say you have provisioned 20 GB of EBS volume for a particular month. In that case, you are going to pay for 20 GB month. Next, for general purpose GP3, up to 3000 IOPS is free. Any additional over 3000 will be charged 0 0.005 per IOPS month. Please remember, for general purpose GP3 and for provision IOPS, AWS will charge you per GB month for the volume and for IOPS, IOPS month. Now here is for provision IOPS IO2, 0.065 provision IOPS month up to 32,000 IOPS. If you are using anything more than 32,000, then the per IOPS charge will be reduced. That means, let's say you are using 64,000 IOPS. First, 32,000 will be charged based on 0 0.065 and from 32,000, 1 to 64,000 
will be charged based on that price. So some EBS volume has a bucket based pricing, some has a flat pricing and some has the initial IOPS that is comes as a free. Coming back to throughput optimized, it is only charged based on the GB month for the provision storage. Please remember, so these are based on the provision storage. You can see provision IOPS, provision IOPS, not based on what IOPS or storage you are using for that particular month. And last but not least, for cold HDD, again, this is the lowest cost and AWS will charge you 0.015 per GB month for the provision storage. Now, before we conclude, I would like to summarize. Today we have reviewed features of Amazon EBS. Then we have reviewed different EBS volume types and we have seen their use cases. Then we saw EBS encryption, different key facts. After that, we reviewed EBS snapshots. We also saw EBS optimized EC2 instances, then EBS quota and at the end EBS pricing details. Now we came to a conclusion about today's topic. I hope I was able to clarify all your doubts. If you have any question regarding today's topic, please post your question as comment to this video. We will answer at earliest. Before we conclude today, I would like to request you please subscribe our channel and please click on the bell icon to get notification for new topics. If you want me to cover any topics, please provide your request as a comment on this video. If you appreciate our effort, please like this video. It will definitely motivate us. At the end, thank you. Please take care and stay safe.